Hello everyone. Um, thank you for joining the webinar on legal issues in African football. My name, if you don't know who I am, my name is Sean Cottrell. I'm the founder and CEO of Law in Sport. We're just about to start the webinar shortly um, and uh, we're just waiting for an, a, a few more people to sign in. We had just under, I think it was just under 100 people who had signed up to the webinar. Um, so we always like to give just a few minutes for people um, just to start because um, inevitably they, um, yeah, people have some technical issues logging in. So whilst we're doing that, um, I'll first of all, I'll introduce you to um, our speakers for today. So we have uh, Professor DG Akinuli. He is the um, Professor of Law and a Senior Advocate in Nigeria, and he's at the Nigerian Institute of Advanced Legal Studies. He's an expert in sports law and also um, worked on the UNODC handbook on the confiscation of proceeds of crime. We have, uh, welcome DG. <laughs> I'm going to basically Hi, welcome you all one by one. <laughs> Thanks for joining. Um, we have uh, Faraya Ranzano, who is a director of Mazesco, Murphy and Nigilo and Ranzo Inc. He practices and focuses on sports law and entertainment law. Uh, he represents clubs, uh, uh, player associations, associations, etc. Then finally, we have Kelvin Umajunin. Um, Kelvin, sorry if I just pronounced your name wrong <laughs> at the end. Um, <laughs> Um, he's a specialist in sports governance. He has experience which includes working in football regulatory bodies in Nigeria on compliance and regulatory issues, as well as being uh, a membership of the disciplinary committee of Nigerian Football Federation. Uh, welcome, Kelvin. Welcome, Fry. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome. Um, so, these, welcome to our speakers. They're going to be discussing what they think are some of the most pressing issues at this moment in time in African football. Um, I put out just a tweet recently to say, you know, there's a lot, and Kelvin, I think you did the same. There's a lot to cover in an hour. We're going to do our best. Inevitably, we're not going to be able to cover everything. We've had some questions already from people who have submitted over email, um, but I'll go through the format of how we're going to work for that. Now, to assist me in facilitating the discussion, I have my colleague, uh, Chris Bond, who's the editor of Law in Sport. Chris has... Um, uh, was a, was a law, lawyer in his past life, but also is, has edited probably somewhere close to a thousand, if not more now, um, legal issue, um, sorry, articles on uh, legal issues in sports law globally. And so he'll bring in that, that perspective as well, but particularly there. So Chris, welcome. Hi, hi everyone. Right, so uh, for those of you that, that aren't familiar with law and sport, our main purpose is to help people understand the latest legal issues and developments from the world of sport. We produce peer-reviewed articles, we do things like this, open webinars, we do private events, we do networking, we've got a global mentoring scheme, which we have uh, 46 mentees from 13 countries around the world, and we do a bunch of other different things. Uh, anyway, that's just an introduction if you're not familiar with law and sport, but it's importantly that our three speakers today are part of our um, recently established African editorial board who are helping us to make sure we can identify the, uh, the important issues that are taking place in the continent um, to make sure that we can address those properly, help and assist and explain some of the uh, developments that are taking place. So that's just to put that in context. The format of the discussion is the speaker is going to start. I'm going to ask a few questions. They will give their perspective on some of the issues they want to talk about. We'll kind of have a round table discussion. Um, and at any point, if you want to ask questions in the interface that you have, um, hopefully, if you've got the same interface that, that we have, and I think you do, um, you can either write questions. Um, so already um, some people have responded. So uh, thank you for that. <laughs> um, he's saying good morning. So thank you, Shikineko. I'm going to I'm I apologize if I get anyone's name wrong. Those of you who have joined any law and sport webinars before, I often do. So please forgive me for that. Um, so you can ask questions by typing them in. You can also, we can see uh, all the attendees who are on. And so, Iquo, uh, we can see that you've asked, you put your hands up to ask a question. So at some point we can come to you. You can either type it if you want immediate response. Uh, and Martin's, um, Ember, I can see that you've already raised your hand and I know that you've already um, uh, submitted some questions. So. Hopefully that was a whistle stop tour introduction. The thing that you're, you know, you'd like to know, <laughs> obviously, is uh, importantly, is some of the legal issues in African football. So some of the topics we've previously discussed and hoped to cover 
on this uh, will be governance, regulatory issues, dispute resolution, player rights and welfare, and the commercialization and associated intellectual property rights. Um, but uh, as, a, as a kind of uh, a starter for 10, um, Digi, did you want to start off um, from your perspective in terms of areas that you've been focusing on, some of the stuff that, um, you know, particularly around governance, I know is, is a particular area of interest to you. What's going on at the moment on the continent um, and issues that you think you, that, that, that are important for our attendees to listen, uh, to, to understand and learn about? Thank you, Sean. Um, I, I think that um, events of the recent past highlight uh, three, three critical governance issues. Uh, corruption has always been there. Uh, and it seems to me that if FIFA and uh, the collaborating partners uh, consistently harp upon integrity in sports and also the need to have um, fair play and also the need to project sports positively, certainly the issue of corruption and how FIFA and its uh, collaborating associations and confederations deal with it cannot be overemphasized. But try as they would, this issue has not gone away. And uh, we see the way it's, it's impacting even on governance, particularly the way that um, FIFA has related to, again, its confederations uh, early this um, uh, this uh, this month we saw FIFA appointing um, the general secretary to kind of oversee uh, the uh, African confederation again if you look at that the issues are remotely connected with uh, corruption issues so that is a major issue. The other issue, of course, is the relationship uh, with governments of national associations. And I, I think that probably thirdly would be how FIFA itself uh, runs a check on integrity in games and, and, and matches that are being played around the world. And Let so, so, so. So I was just going to say, though, just for background for people, they've probably already uh, been following this, but we've obviously had uh, uh, Fatima Samura uh, come in uh, yes. at the, the um, at CAF, who, the regional uh, body of African football, the governance body of African football, yeah. to oversee that. I think the title was, uh, title was yeah. trying to get it up, I think I've got it up. High Commissioner yeah. of Africa. I think she's yeah. coming as that, and that's partly due to the the former president who uh, is under investigation at the moment uh, for corruption oh, and I think some harassment issues. Right. right. So, right. Um, maybe did you want to explain as well that, that some of the challenges with within relation to governments with that this? Yeah, you know, I know that we've got some questions on this, but how how you perceive it in terms of you know if we were looking academically at rule of law and um, a separation of principles or separation of power um how you see this relationship between the um national associations uh, and caf um and the, the the governments and obviously there's we're talking about uh, uh yeah we understand that we're talking about a vast um amount of countries with different political systems but uh, maybe you want to talk about that and particularly around nigeria and and how that is in kelvin maybe you want to um you know yeah. Uh, in, intervene as well. Okay, so um, I look at this and say there are actually two kinds of laws or rules or rules of law, if you like. There is a private law that's the contractual, the uh, which yes, which is largely contractual and also private interest. Uh, uh, and and I say that. FIFA statutes and um, the status of national associations are very pat on that in terms of non-interference. So they can agree 
amongst association members that if you want to do things, this is the way you do it. If you want to vote, this is the way we vote. If you have a grievance, this is the way you need to um, ventilate your grievance. But over and above this, there is also the general law, uh, criminal law, for instance. The issue of criminal law, the issue of um, public laws in terms of constitutional rights for people, the issue of employment law. There, there is a tension in employment law, but as far as criminal law and constitutional law is concerned, uh, I believe that uh, the ordinary courts have certainly uh, rebuffed any notion that uh, disputes cannot go to court. Now, what has happened, however, is that within the um, organization, that's between FIFA, CAF, and the national associations, pressure has always been brought to bear on any errant member that tries to invoke outside or external uh, adjudicatory bodies for disputes like this. But the jurisprudence that has flowed from the courts has been to say that the courts certainly have the right to wade into this, particularly in criminal law. I mean, so, in so, criminal so, one law one, so would I be correct in saying then that the, um, from your perspective, there's this tension and it's something we discussed at, the, at our football law conference. We had Sarah Sonmal, who is, um, uh, who is, um, looks after member associations for Africa at FIFA. And she talks about this, that the, the, you have this situation. So you're saying so in Nigeria, so the courts have recognized, you know, that you, you know, you still got the right essentially to go to court, but due to political pressures um, within, would that be both within the football family and politics more broadly, um, they discourage that type of action. Um, so therefore it just remains, as we would say in the, in the, in the, let's say football family. Right. So, uh, and therefore that, that, that creates a, um, uh, a lack of access to justice, let's say, or, um, a lack of, uh, scrutiny. That'd be correct. Okay. okay. Yes. So it's, I like, I like that phrase, the football family. So the pressure is really from the football family. And this is what they are saying. You signed up to something. You signed up to a charter to keep disputes out of public space and subject yourself to the various judicial panels and the various mechanisms under the statute. And so you, uh, you have a duty to keep to that. And so that's between, that's why I said it's largely contractual. It's largely contractual, more like a club uh, membership thing. But as far as the courts are concerned, especially where it now involves somebody who is not really bound, or who is not a member of the family, the courts have generally said that um, they will not um, stay off simply because it involves um, uh, some matter or some quarrel within the family. And so um, now I know that from, so for I, from a South African perspective, it'd be interesting to get to see how, how you know, looking at, particularly if we focus on say Nigeria and South Africa at the moment, and then we can bring in other areas as well. Uh, for I, maybe you just want to talk about how that compares to how uh, sport and particularly football is set up in South Africa. And then Kelvin, we can come back to you because obviously you've got a very interesting take on this one from a first-hand experience working with the, the Nigerian Football Federation. So for I, uh, uh, thanks, thanks, Sean. Uh, I agree with DG largely when it comes to that division of private versus uh, public. Uh, certainly, when it comes to criminal matters, I think no matter how much the football family would want to keep uh, that dirty linen uh, internal, the, 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 the authorities have always in interfered. And, and if there's a crime that has been committed uh, when, when one of the association members or officials uh, breaches their ethical duties in terms of their own uh, statutes, 
the criminal authorities would uh, get involved. But uh, there, there is to a degree uh, a reluctance, though, to, to get involved when it comes to criminal matters, because I don't know if you would recall that there was a talk about South Africa having bribed, uh, paid bribes for the 2010 World Cup. I think it was $15 million of that sort. And uh, the, the Minister of Sport here had jumped straight into it and, and, and voiced these concerns about it and saying the criminal authorities will make sure people are held to account. And then later on, it was all swept under the carpet. But one thing that came out of that uh, was FIFA was quick to say, well, this is an internal... First, they denied it, obviously, but then it was it was uh, painted as a, as a governance issue at, at a football... Uh, uh, governance as a football governance issue, and FIFA would look into it, and there would be a special task to investigate. And FIFA would collaborate with uh, South African uh, Football Association, and because of that, there, there wasn't really a follow through when it came to the criminal justice system. And one gets the sense that it probably was the authorities sort of uh, exercising some restraint, saying that look, we we are of the view that. The crimes may have been committed here, but the football fraternity might be able to deal with it, so we're not just going to jump uh, into it. And, and, and so that's on the one hand. On the other hand, when you look at the private law, as, as DG identified, especially when it comes to disputes now, let's identify one of a pure sporting, sporting interest. So, for instance, Last year, we had a big case uh, involving uh, Premier Soccer League football club, Ajax Cape Town, having been uh, sanctioned by the Premier Soccer League for uh, fielding an ineligible footballer. That matter ran through uh, the internal pro uh, processes, but Ajax then took it to, court on, to the High Court on review because they were not happy with the way they were sanctioned or the matter was handled. And the courts were, were very clear to say, look, we appreciate that there may be this uh, contractual arrangement, but at the end of the day, uh, you're still subject to the national laws. It, you do, uh, whatever arrangements you have, do not ask the jurisdiction of the courts. And the court even went as far as actually identifying that, well, look, all this administration of football in, in South Africa by the Premier Soccer League, SAFA, and, the, and FIFA, uh, in South Africa amounts to administrative action and the courts will always have the power to review their decisions under the promotion of justice uh, of administrative justice act so from that you get a sense that uh, while uh, while the public bodies or courts appreciate that there is that divide when it comes to sport because of the ways it's uh, regulated uh, regulated they still retain that that, that, uh, that you can provide the power that they would get involved if, if, if necessary. But that doesn't mean they, they, they readily get involved, though. In, in Doro, the court was clear that you need to exhaust all the internal remedies first before you know, it's best of the court. Um, and are you, are you, are you seeing, in South Africa, are you seeing more um, with, uh, you know, since post World Cup and uh, obviously with the, the Premier Soccer League, um, there's been a lot of legal actions going on in, uh, in and around it. Um, are you seeing that, the, that inevitably as there's more money coming into it and, it, and it's starting to professionalise more that they're then starting to the, um, let's say, the legal infrastructure around it and regulatory structure around it is starting to be, is that indicative of that being tested more? Certainly. I, I think uh, we're... From a South African perspective, you have to divide the, the professional football and football in general. I think professional football has always been sort of at the forefront when it came to uh, these uh, regulatory issues, having the structures in place. They've always had uh, a disciplinary, uh, a vibrant disciplinary processes, I would say. And on the other uh, hand, they've always had a dispute resolution chamber that has always worked and, and so forth. Uh, so the World Cup uh, would have accelerated that because obviously it, it attracted more attention to, to football as a sport. Uh, more money would have come through as a result of, 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 of the World Cup. And from a, from a disciplinary process, I, I, I haven't seen uh, a, a huge sort of growth in that because 
I think it's a purely internal matter sort of thing. But from a uh, contractual side where with clubs and, and players and so forth, where you now sort of bring in the, the public laws, employment laws and so forth, uh, I think there has been a, a growth in terms of the disputes around it. The World Cup brought up some vibe that sort of enlightened everyone up about their rights and so forth. And so there has been that growth, especially on, on, on the uh, contractual private side of it, private side of it. On, on, on the and, and, so, and for those people that aren't familiar with, um, there's been some developments in sort of the, the structure of South African football, I believe. Do you just want to, um, before we come on to Kelvin and then getting your take on sort of what's going on in Nigeria and then obviously, um, well not obviously, but you know, your view from like what some of the challenges are and how we can address some of those challenges around governance. Uh, for our, did you want to um, just articulate sort of what's going on about who owns the clubs, the, you know, how does the, the, the club structure work within the, the National Association? Okay, so so at, at, at the top is the South African Football Association, uh, which, which is which governs all football in South Africa, and then and, and then they have regional members. I think there are 52 of them, and so forth. Uh, and then on the other hand, there is the Premier Soccer League, which uh, is a special member of SAFA, and they regulate professional football. Uh, and I must say, there's there's always tension between the two because. Uh, <laughs> Premier Soccer League has more money uh, than the South African Football Association. And I understand as it stands now, there are some other sort of uh, regulatory issues where SAFA has brought in a sponsor for referees. So referees have now ad advertising on their shirts when they are refereeing Premier Soccer League matches and they advertise as a competitor of the Premier Soccer League. And, and, and the Premier Soccer League says, hey, but you can't do that because you're infringing on our sponsors, right? And they said, no, no, we regulate football in South Africa. We have the power to do that. And, and, and that's an ongoing dispute. It would be interesting to see where it ends. That could be really interesting to see. Because yeah. that's the, the, one, of the, one of the, if you look at the sort of, sort of why sport in wherever it's in America, the Eurocentric, let's say, sport, it's obviously um, the, it's growth in popularity and money, particularly in football, has come from media rights, so the selling of, of access to, to view the, the um, football, uh, whether it's now over the top platforms or, or traditional broadcast means. And obviously the associated sponsorship becomes more and more important. So it could be really interesting to see how uh, in each jurisdiction in Africa, they, they're gonna deal with this tension because you know we talked about this briefly and maybe we can come on to uh, Kelvin in a minute, but you know, the, even just the concept of intellectual property rights and um, how they're enforced um, is, is, is not necessarily always a ha how you'd expect it to be. Certainly, certainly. It, it's, it's, it, 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 there's always that challenge where, especially if in this context of the hierarchy where the one says we are responsible for all football in South Africa, you are sort of subordinates to us. Maybe before you even contracted with your sponsors, you should have sought uh, consent from us and so forth. So that's, that's, that's on the one end. And when you come to the Premier Soccer League, structurally, uh, it's, it's an association of all the clubs that make up the league. I think there are 32 of them, 16 in the Premier Division, 16 in the National First Division. But then it's governed by an executive committee, which is basically uh, elected officials of the football clubs, which also brings on its own tensions when it comes to uh, conflicts of interest and so forth, because chairmen or officials of the various clubs are elected onto the eight, I think, eight or nine member executive committee. Uh, and that brings its own issues. And I'm sure DG would, would be interested in commenting on that when it comes to conf conflict of interest and whether you know they can be really independent when, when they exercise their duties. So, so maybe there's, uh, you know, let's get this, let's, let's bring Kelvin in, but then did you just come back to you on that conflict of interest point? Because I think that's one that in the broader <clears throat> worldwide and global sport, uh, and particularly football, is consistently brought up as a, as a real problem uh, about how we address this because it's such a small um, sector, really. And, you know, it's, you know, as I said, the family word, but like, yeah, everyone knows each other. So you end up inevitably getting when you've got a small pool, pool of people you're selecting from, this issue of conflict always comes up. Um, Kelvin, from your, from your perspective, obviously, you you like heavily focus on sort of all the uh, commercialization of football. And obviously, Nigeria's got a huge population and it's been identified 
by FIBA um, and the NBA is one of the you know the, the nations to include in their new um, African Basketball League. Uh, did you want to talk about uh, you know what you think about what the, the commercialization of sport could offer? Let's just say in solutions to some of these conflicts of interest and governance problems, um, and give an up to date sort of like you know update on what's going on in Nigeria at the moment. Uh, I think that the biggest issue we have in sports is we are lagging behind because sports in not just Nigeria, Africa as a whole, is um, under commercialized, if I should uh, put to describe it that way. So yeah, essentially, when we're talking of commercialization, it's organizing um, activities in a way that will make uh, profits. And of course, sports being what it is now, big business, of course, the money speaks a lot and does, does a lot in the industry. And, if you look at when you talk or think of Africa, you, you, the ch societal challenges that readily come to mind are underemployment and um, infrastructure and all. And it's obvious from what we've seen in Europe, Asia, America, that um, sports goes a long way in addressing some of these issues. In um, statistics have shown recently in um, this, this part that even the rate of employment in sports oh, has okay. been faster. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you, yeah. It has, has been faster than national employment rate as a whole. And if you look at um, countries where sports is uh, largely commercialized, you see that the sports industry goes a long way to cover the gap in terms of um, national employment. So why is um, sports not commercialized in Africa? Governance issues largely, trust. When you talk of commercialization, of course, the private sector plays a huge part. But because of this lack of trust and the governance issues, lack of transparency, accountability, inadequate dispute resolution, they stay away because they do not see it as a, as a profitable you know, venture. So I think um, this commercialization is still tied to our governance issues. And um, using Nigeria as an instance, I think one basic governance issue we have is the structure of our sports federations, our sports governing bodies. Um, in most parts, you see that um, they are registered as private entities, corporate bodies, maybe non-profits and what have you. But here in Nigeria, historically, they've been either an appendage of the sports ministry or established by law. Football, of course, which is the number one sport in, in Nigeria, over the years has always had a law establishing the football governing body. The, um, before we had um, Decree 101, then we had the 2004 Nigeria Football Association Act, and recently the National Assembly passed into law what is supposed to be the Nigeria Football Federation Act. And then um, one question I ask is, we have a law setting up the Nigeria Football Federation. How come we do not have a law setting up the Nigeria Basketball Association or the Nigeria Cricket Association and what have you? So we, we need to really sit down and address these issues because you want sports to go holistically. And I, I just think basically the stakeholders in the respective sports need to you know, come together, set up a corporate body, either limited by guarantee for profit or non-for-profit, because when you have such private establishments, it goes a long way in improving their structure, the efficiency, and what have you. And once this is addressed, you see that the private sector comes in, there's a boost in um, investment, and generally everything kicks off and you have the conversation. And would you say that the, and Chris, sorry, jump in if you want to ask any questions, but the, um, and sorry, by the way, for those of you who are watching, uh, Kelvin is not Chris, <laughs> he's not on twice. <laughs> Um, it's, it's just the, the link that was used was, uh, has got confused with the names, so apologies for that. Um, but we talked about this before, and, and you know, one of the, 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 the pressures that could be applied, let's say, hopefully positively from commercial partners, could be to improve the governance standards and create more accountability. It would seem to me that you know, if you're investing in the sport, you'd want more legal certainty, right? So, uh, particularly within football. Now, I know that there was some issues around. Um, say, for example, I may want to touch on this and this whole conflict of interest point, the things that could cause problems, obviously, there's um, uh, 
and we've hopefully got an article coming on this, but uh, the VAR issue around the um, the African Champions League, um, you know, and how that was dealt with. There was seems to be um, from an outsider's perspective, anyway, uh, they say just a slight bit of tension there, and <laughs> um, uh, so I'm not sure if anyone would like to pick that up. But I can give some background if that's useful. But would anyone like to sort of discuss about how that was was, was kind of uh, is being dealt with and what the perception, at least, was was um, in terms of potential conflicts? Yeah, I would think that with issues um, such as VR, it flows from the international governing body. We see FIFA in football using um, VR widely in their competition. So it's only apt that down to the confederations and even national federations, Spain, England now, and sometime in the not too distant future, hopefully Nigeria would adopt it. I think um, VAR is about balancing integrity of competition and then of course the entertainment value. Because some people, have the impression that look you want talking points was it did it cross the line did it not cross the line and the controversy keeps people talking even after the game but then again from the sporting perspective you do not want to lose a game that you should have won so i think it's about this balance and um for me what is supreme is the integrity of the competition you know what, what i noticed from um VAR is, by as the referee is watching the replays, you could nine and a half times out of ten know what his decision would be. That is, if you understand the rules specifically and objectively, you could. So I think that objectivity is invaluable. So long as um, alone you so, don't um, yeah. So so what happens though in this sort of situation with was it Wyad? Is it is that right? How you say it? Wyad? Is that we correct? Did. Yeah, um, uh, having this um, uh, situation um, where um, the I believe there was a review of the VAR, the VAR official wasn't there or didn't. I can't remember what the exact facts are now. Um, maybe for I, maybe you want to talk about this. And then it went to appeal, and then basically, or the executive I think reviewed it, and then the executive of CAF made a decision that the game should be replayed. Um, was that was that is that the correct? Um, to, oh, hopefully, I'm giving the correct assessment of that. Before I what like is in, I think there was some rest. If so, you know, from one of uh, your colleagues in South Africa was raising some questions about you know whether or not that was um, basically whether you could entrust, given all the corruption issues that have taken place and the, as you were talking about the political manoeuvring of officials and we see this within Europe we see it all over the world in terms of sport is used often for political gains uh, uh you know can, can you trust that system is that something you've got faith with is that something that needs to be reviewed more holistically are there you know coming to a question from Martin's ember was like you know should there just be you know throughout like people committing to like four key principles of good governance if you see what I mean as a as a driver for uh positive change Fry, so I'm addressing that to you. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, so you, you are right, uh, Sean, in, 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 particularly with this VAR thing. So what happened there was that match uh, between uh, Witted Casablanca and Esperance. There was supposed to be uh, VAR equipment at the match. Uh, unfortunately, this is the story we are told. We, we don't know whether that's true or not. Unfortunately, the equipment never made its way onto the plane, and then it never made its way to, to, to the game. And, and then there was a controversial decision during the, the game, which uh, Casablanca were not happy with, and they walked off the pitch because they, they believed that there would be uh, VAR on the day. So, so naturally, you would say, OK, let's refer it. And then they would say, no, no, but there's no equipment. And they were not happy with that. They walked off the pitch. And naturally, you then expect that the laws or the rules are followed because the, the laws of the game are clear. What, what happens when situations like that happen? I mean, the referee has the final decision. He, he called off the match. And uh, Esperance were, were, were then handed the, the title and they were told you've won because the game is now being abandoned and so forth. They, they were given medals and everyone went home happy. 
uh, uh, but but what happened in that case, which is the governance issues, you saw the executive walking onto the pitch trying to solve the issue, which in my view is, is not their place to be. They should have just left the referee decide uh, and, and we carry on. They walked off the pitch on the pitch. They tried to solve it, didn't work, and in eventual Esperance we granted the title. But then weeks or a week or two later, we had that no, 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 there was then a CAF uh, executive committee meeting uh, in France there, and it was decided that this match is now going to be replayed. And, and then you ask yourself, uh, where do you draw the line? I mean, traditionally, all football or sporting uh, governance issues, you would find that tribunals or even the executive committee does not get involved in refereeing issues. You know, once the referee says it's a goal, it's a goal. Whether it was a blatant uh, handball, if it, does, it, it doesn't matter. But in this case, they got involved. So it brings in issues of when you tie that with this corruption issues that DG was mentioning earlier, where there are doubts whether the VAR equipment was not even there or it did not make its way there. Why did it not make its way? Was this uh, a, a pre-designed thing? And, and is that one? Sorry, is that is that an issue of? Um, I'm going to come to. So I think Equo uh, has put their hand up to ask a question, and, and, and Martin Ember, if you want, I'm going to turn your mics on in a minute so you can ask a question. Um, there's my points, but this this. Um, so you could look at it and say that the officials, you know, the executive were just trying to help, right? They've been helpful. So is it is it a question of naivety or is it um, in terms of like what we consider to be like due process and having those, those you know, they say, um, yeah, it's like a, a separation of power between the executive. Yeah, the separation of power points or, or you know, experience in, in dealing with those matters or, or is it something that you think was um, more uh, sort of indicative of... Um, this, I was going to say, I was going to be, <laughs> we'll choose my words carefully. This is uh, improper conduct. Yeah. Well, uh, I would think uh, in a perfect world where issues that we, we are grappling with of poor governance and corruption and so, and so forth didn't exist, you probably would say maybe it's naivety. They just thought we can try and help. But in this context, I think it's a, it's a, uh, a lack of appreciation of the governance roles they play a lack of appreciation of the rules, uh, and more importantly, probably a lack of appreciation of uh, what their powers are. So in this case, you would have thought the CAF president thought, I'm the president, I can walk in there and tell them this is what's going to happen, and they would, they would deal with it. That's, that's basically what it is. And when you look at the history of this uh, federation where we have uh, had a long reign of a particular president who, to a degree, had started sort of uh, becoming an institution <laughs> in himself, that sort of thing. So I think it was absolutely a bad faith issue, uh, uh, motivated by thinking they have the power anyway. We are the executive committee. We now make the decision. Because then if you follow that through with the second decision to then say, OK, we are now going to replay. You know, so if you think the first decision to walk onto the pitch was a mistake, we didn't know what was going on. The referee then said the match is over, uh, Esperanza won. But they went again and still said, no, no, it's now going to be replayed. So so it's really it's really interesting. DJ, I'm not sure if you want something to add, but I think if do you have anything you want to add? Yes, uh, quickly just to say that, um, well, that that's what happened there someone called it governance assisted refereeing because really um it, it's just a lack of appreciation of their roles the rules already had established what should happen if a walkout occurred and obviously i don't know the kind of um, dynamics that were at play uh in, in in reversing what the rules are because you see this this question don't forget um arose in relation to the expectations of sponsors and right. yeah. any sponsor has a right to expect that there is certainty in the rules of the game and you look at the rules of the game which sponsor or which 
investor will back any competition that says, well, we have a preemptive right to overrule whatever the referee says. Because that, in essence, is what happened. Referee makes a decision, player walks away, then officials take a decision, stage one, stage two, they take another decision. Total chaos, as far as I'm concerned. And uh, whether naiv naivety or overreaching, it's not good for the game. So, so okay, that's that's really interesting. We've had a question from Joseph Vandalos as well around around some of these issues around commercialization uh, through around both both players and, and media rights. But before I do that, I'm just going to uh, come to Equo. Hopefully, this works. Let's connect you to audio. Unmute Equo. Uh, let's have a look. Let's have a look. Uh, uh, hopefully, so Equo, you can if you're listening. I hope I'm saying your name correctly. If you can, uh, I've unmuted you, so you should, in theory, be able to turn your microphone on and ask a question if you would like. There we go. Yeah, your mic's on now, so you can ask a question. <laughs> I've been really enjoying this. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, in, uh, my question, Dennis, um, you know, indisputably that the largest concession to FIFA by the member association, there's authority over the um, executive affairs, i.e. to remove the executive um, 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 body of a member association and replace it for a specified period with a normalization um, committee. So the question then is, what if the normalization committee also fails? Because what is happening in Ghana is that normalization yeah. committee is asking um, 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 citizens, since the government cannot support them, to dole out say 1.5 million to help with with with, with, with um, to support the Premier League um, teams to help manage it to help bring them up to help in the payment of these players in the whole of but my understanding is, is FIFA is a private organization and <laughs> apparently you can't ask me as a taxpayer to contribute <laughs> to the, the FA in its running. So, so that normalization committee, has, uh, I think, that keeps failing, but FIFA keeps extending the period for the normalization um, um, committee. So, 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 brilliant. So is there, a, is there a question, though? I think that's a really great topic of discussion, the normalization committees. And we I said we had uh, uh, Sarah Salamali from uh, FIFA talk about this to a degree, about the limitations of a private entity and what influence exactly. they can have. Um, but so... To, but, uh, so we can talk. We can definitely talk about that. I think a little bit more. Def definitely some bits there worth discussing. Um, right. Is there a, is there a specific question though within that? The the, the question then is, um, if citizens are saying that the normalisation keeps on um, failing, what then do FIFA extend the mandate of the normalisation committee? Because as of now, they are also um, embroiled in corruption activities, and it's apparent match fixing are going on a whole lot. So as a citizen. What can I do about it? Because FIFA keep changing the members of the normalization committee, keep extending their, their mandate. Okay, yes, okay. So, so, so what happens? So the question would be then, what happens if they normalize? Well, there's two questions, I think, from this. And I'm going to mute your mic just so we can uh, to get going so in a minute. But I'll just let you, if I've got this right. One, should FIFA be able to keep extending the normalization committees? And then the second question you had was, um, as, a, as a taxpayer of the country, having a private entity basically um, influence the government to encourage investment Fantastic. is something that you're not, not particularly comfortable with. Is that correct? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, brilliant. Exactly. Okay, well, thanks for the great question. Uh, I think we just lost Kelvin for some reason, but um, I'm just going to mute your mic, Equo. Thanks for that. Great question. Um, who would like to take that? Well, let me let me uh, try to understand this. Um, these uh, committees, uh, from inception, were never meant to be permanent, and uh, I believe that FIFA took the cue from some governments that, especially as happened in Nigeria some years back when a caretaker committee was set up uh, to replace the standing committee. And FIFA took, uh, took offense at that and uh, unleashed a number of um, uh, reprisal measures against uh, Nigeria. Okay, so 
apparently FIFA does not see anything wrong in doing this. And uh, the truth of the matter is that it's, it's, it is like uh, uh, Echo said, this should not be a permanent thing. I rather think, because I've looked through the statutes, and I think that just as FIFA insists on the autonomy of uh, confederations and associations, as between those bodies and governments, even as between FIFA and those bodies, there should be some autonomy. And so it's not really something that uh, FIFA can wade in on. And I think there is an interesting conversation going on right now between uh, the president of UEFA and uh, FIFA, particularly about this um, um, appointment of the general secretary to come oversee CAF. You know, so these are the kinds of... Uh, so, so yeah, yeah, I think it's a really interesting. So I've got something to add in terms of some other, I think, relevant component parts that are changing around the back of this. Uh, in football generally, which I think will be relevant. So there's, because it's kind of like a, um, welcome back, Kelvin. You still haven't got your name right though. It's still Chris Bond for some reason, but <laughs> yeah, you, um, we'll, we'll get that fixed for the next one we do. Um, Farai, did you, did you want to, to, to add the think on that? In terms yeah, of uh, how you stand on it. I think the, the second point that uh, uh, Eko raised about as a taxpayer, you wouldn't feel comfortable with that. I, I think one of the things that international federations have done very well is sort of to ring fence themselves against government uh, government involvement and so forth. So in, in this case, you would think the government can't say much because they'll say that's government interference, as DG has mentioned. But I, I don't see anything, and, and I'm, not, I'm not by any means advocating a, a lawlessness or a revolt here. But I, I don't see anything stopping then the government from uh, investing any further funds into that cause. If, 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 because remember, from a South African perspective, you have the government through SASCOP and, and, and so forth, which is uh, the overseeing body of all sporting federations. In, uh, they, they put money aside for sports and all that. And if that happens and, and the government is not happy, why should they keep putting the taxpayers' money into a, a normalization committee that's not working? They, they so I'm, I'm going to um, chuck the cat amongst the pigeons on this one a little bit, right? So in theory, let's say, in theory, right, FIFA is there to help develop world football, right, and the government's world football. And they've had development funds, right? So money's been distributed. And it's something that, um, again, at our conference we had, and the video should be on Law and Sport uh, for members to access um in the next week or so so you can all watch that but they were talking about some of the problems of distributing money from fifa right so so you know there's a change of guard anyway at fifa anyway but they've there's at times been money that's been distributed out and it hasn't necessarily gone to where it's meant to have gone to right and so the one argument would be well the normalization committee is there in in theory to try to set up some basic government structures right because in theory the statutes of FIFA are quite clear and, and CAF basically adopts the standard statutes. Everyone should follow that procedure. And if you're going to get any money, then you have to meet that criteria. Now, that tension between, and I think this is you know, something to bear in mind with other industries as well, that tension between where you attract investment or you know, get funds for development and then how you match that is, is one that I think is it creates a real tension, particularly with either past conduct or this... Um, you know, uh, autonomy of small autonomy of sport, um, particularly football argument. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the right answer is, but um, I just think it creates this really life tension. The good news is there's, which I think good news in theory. Let's say again in practice, we'll see how it works out. One FIFA have committed to human rights, so there's a, now a huge obligation. In, again, in theory, for them to, to, as a private entity, to meet what other businesses have done, that's going to have a huge impact, I think, on these type of activities. Um, we've, we've done some. We've got some updates coming on this as well. Webinar on this. Um, the ethics code has changed and become much more robust. So that will have an impact. I think the question for national governments it would seem to me, and and for 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 Equo and for everyone else, would be to what extent does everyone in their local um, uh, jurisdiction uh, want to influence and have government influence on sport and support 
with sport and no doubt it'd be an evolutionary process like it is everywhere but I think that's maybe that's something in terms of maybe we can do a topic on that in terms of what what should that balance be in terms of you know uh, sport for development and so forth um development of sport great question Ikro um going back to the one from uh, uh Josip um Joseph basically he was arguing basically in his experience clubs and players are not basically getting the the money that's being distributed down from from media rights as you would see in Europe and in the US for example where you you've got sort of more certainty other we 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 talked about this in the past where you know uh, in Nigeria for example you've got Nollywood uh this massive like sort of media um uh, distribution network and and output you'd think that you could create a sports product that could um uh be distributed on uh, on media what's the what's the sort of issues around piracy um you know what the sort of you know your view on on the on the sort of commercialization of media rights and how that is distributed and, and i guess you could add in sponsorship how that is distributed down between the clubs and then onto the players and maybe we can get onto some player rights stuff as well um which i think is very which is very very important um who wants to take that in terms of maybe Kelvin on the commercialization side? How do you see the media rights sort of landscape, the commercialization of media rights, and then that sponsorship? We can maybe come to uh, Farai and then uh, DG. Okay, uh, what I'd say is as um, players, clubs, the only reason why they would want a share is because they are stakeholders. And um, you are a stakeholder, you need to have a seat at the table. To be able to you know put pressure and have an influence but it still goes down to the setup the structure of our national sports um, federations first of all players union how how effective are they the club bodies how effective are they not just in the day-to-day -day running of the leagues but also in the decision making process when you are electing uh, president of the nigeria football federation you know the clubs, what number of votes or what percentage of votes do they have? The players or their union, what percentage? Do they have members on the board? These are lacking from the setup. That's why I feel if um, our federation should consist of private, uh, the stakeholders, private stakeholders coming together to register as a corporate entity, I think that would go a long way in addressing these issues. The players, the clubs, they would have their representatives on the board of the federation who would be able to push, push for this. Because now they don't have um, much of a say. That is why they they are lagging behind. I think that is just a summary of it. Uh, and so, so we've got some actually on this point. I'm not sure if anyone else wants to come in, but there's some some interrelated questions that have just come in from people, which I think tie into this. But uh, Farai and and Digi, did you want to sort of talk about this as well, or uh, you know, I think Farai, I know that you've got an interesting perspective on this. Um, and Digi, you, uh, you know, I'm not sure if, if you want to add to this. Uh, I would just add on, on the media rights uh, aspect, and I think uh, there again it, it, it goes with this divide of the national federation or professional leagues, because uh, from, a, from a South African perspective, the, the, the Premier Soccer League has much more valuable media rights than the, the, the national federation uh, when it comes to the national teams. And I think they've done well, they, they've got uh, uh, very good uh, broadcast sponsorships in place, and 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 when one follows follows the history of that, you'd see that uh, the more the the, the broadcast uh, rights are, are going, the value is going up, uh, and then the more money they are getting from broadcasters, uh, that money is sort of trickling down to to the clubs in the sense that the grants that the clubs get monthly are, are also quite higher, especially in the Premier Division. Of, of the league, the national first division is still an issue, but in the premier division, I think there is an equitable uh, distribution because they sell the rights as a, as a bundle and uh, the money is distributed. Every club gets the same amount in a monthly grant or an annual grant. And that has to a degree trickle down to players where you start seeing salaries of footballers also slight, getting slightly higher. And when you look at their image rights sort of thing, some clubs do pay uh, image rights uh, that are lucrative to footballers, mainly because they know they're going to be on TV week in, week out, that sort of thing. So I think from a from a professional league perspective, that has happened. From the National Federation, I don't think there's much there because most of their games are not televised anyway. The league that they run is uh, to some degree in, in shambles. So I don't think 
this this march that is happening there and so on this point though that so so we got a question in basically you in related points and we've talked about this in terms of respect of image rights i know from the um uh, tom vernon from the from right to play was telling me that some people uh, basically he's got an academy in ghana and uh, he was saying that that sometimes agents will basically tell people that they are um that they've acquired the image rights of a player right and the the player they've never known they don't know this person they said look we set up a company we now own your image you now need to give us x percentage and we talked about this in terms of uh players uh, not necessarily understanding their commercial value in south africa where people were letting people use their image all over the place when they were just a developing player and they come on to be like sort of a top national or international player and they've already like given permission for people to use their image because they were um uh happy to i think you said like happy to just basically receive the acclaim would that be correct is that a sort of correct assessment i would think uh especially when you come from the development side uh, the starting point for most youngsters is is the fame not not, not the fortune they they're just quite happy to be uh, everywhere on the billboard and all that and i'm famous but by the time they realize that from that fame should have uh, they should have derived fortune it's too late because they have, as you've said, granted those image rights to their intermediaries or agencies or, or, or somebody else. And that, that's the one aspect. Then the second aspect, which I think also leads to that, is people try to follow the European model where for, for tax purposes and so forth, a separate company or entity is, is, is incorporated, it holds the rights, but they don't quite understand what that means. So half the time, the, the agent acquires those rights and, and they say, well, the player, the, the amounts will be paid to the agent and then it will be paid to the player and all that. It works well when the marriage is still fine, but when it's now uh, in, in the rocky uh, periods, they, it becomes an issue because remember when the player terminates the intermediary uh, contract or the representation agreement, there's still a self-standing image rights agreement. And I think that uh, the, the, the Rooney case many years ago, that's the same thing that sort of keeps happening here, that people don't really, as a starting point, understand the value of their, of their rights. And then they also don't really understand how to exploit them properly. They then get involved in these schemes that in, by the end of the day, they also don't benefit uh, themselves. So, so, that, so that's interesting as well, because if you remember, there was the Mo Salah situation with Egypt as well, where they were using his, the Egypt, Egyptian FA, were using his image all over the place uh, without his permission, basically. Um, and I remember there, there was a lot of issues around that. So the, the question, so I'm just going to run down a bunch of different questions, uh, just because uh, we can roll on for a, a little bit longer, but I imagine other people have allocated an hour and they've probably got other things to do. Um, Sakikiko... I'm so sorry if I'm getting any of these names wrong. Uh, Nibaku, uh, it says, in terms of commercialization, which I think is the point we discussed, what do you think might be the challenges when professional players adapt the concept of becoming a brand? Which, which I guess you, uh, you know, talked about this, the, the image rights. Um, as you compete as a commercial athlete, what does that sort of tension does that, does that play? Mike, I think you kind of touched on that. The other question I'd have, and maybe we can discuss this, would be like player unions. What's the strength of the athletes? So in, in the sports that have commercialized more successfully, the player, generally the uh, players have had quite um, good representation instead of caused that correcting balance. Um, maybe we can you know, get your views on the sort of player unions in a, and where that stands legally in your jurisdictions. Then uh, Kahindi Orochi says governance in governance in African football are, in my opinion, largely born out of the initial dependence on national governments taking the lead in the early days of football development in Africa. A lot of those in key leadership roles in African football today are products of the system and thus found it difficult to allow best practice to rule governance. So it's much more of a statement, but I think, would you agree with that? Essentially, yeah, yeah would you largely agree with that? Um, yeah. I think it, I think it's um, largely correct. So this is just like I said, it's a continuation of the system. So you need to really change the system from the ground up, from the framework, the whole setup, to effect uh, effect the necessary changes. 
I guess it becomes difficult when you feel like, you know, we've seen this across sport generally, when people are like, you know, they may, may have good incentives. They feel like they put so much effort in to get something going. They don't necessarily want to step away, like which is sometimes the right thing to do to, to allow it to flourish. Um, Sakikio Windolo, I think that's right. Windolo, sorry, uh, Sakeko. Okay, um, it's oh man. I should have practiced these. I should have been practicing these names quietly in the background. Um, right, so, oh, thank you. It's a ten for effort. I think they say. <laughs> um, is still logical for right? Is it still logical for FIFA to keep make believe the football and politics have or should have nothing to do with each other? I think this is a great. I think I think this is a great point. Like is in this tension between, you know, no political interference and then sport being used politically to do things. And we've got a bunch of articles on that type of topic with, you know, particularly when uh, say in South Africa, like you had to change laws in order to host the World Cup. Um, what's your what's your views on that? He, go, he goes on to mention uh, considering most of the issues in the football family matters within the remits of governments, uh, fiscality, fraud, labour, human trafficking. So what's, what's your, uh, is it time for FIFA to start collaborating with governments within clearly set frameworks to identify internal issues becomes a matter of public criminal law? Wow, so there's two questions there. Um, how do you see that tension between politics, you know, you know, being politically independent and then obviously sport being used as a political tool? What's your views on that? So can I take that quickly? Absolutely. So I think, um, the politics in that sense is not strictly correct because you are looking at the laws of a country, national laws. So where activities tend towards criminal actions, then the law has got to take its course. So when FIFA says that politics and sports administration should be kept separate, I think it's in the sense that Kelvin has uh, uh, narrated earlier and that's in terms of interference in governance, in terms of nominating or appointing officials or caretaker committees, or interfering in decisions of uh, associations, national associations. And I think in this, uh, FIFA is right because uh, government has a whole bureaucracy in the ministries to contend with. Why do they want to go into uh, federations and association uh, football? Uh, so I think that's the sense in which FIFA says this. But there must be a caveat, really, because you know, just as Nollywood, football will never become just entertainment. It's also, in fact, sports is politics, whether we like it or not. Uh, it raises some, it raises what do you think about the situation so for example where you do have say human rights abuses and now um you know this is something particularly in the asian football confederation where there's alleged human rights abuses and there's been you know pressure applied uh, on fifa to actually and i think in in some situations they've actually taken action the same the ioc have taken action to uh, revoke a, a membership of um certain national associations because of those that's obviously that's politically there's, there's a lot of politics involved in that but that would seem instinctively like a you know even though it may be permitted in the national law it seems instinctively something that they should be doing but like, yeah, think... regardless of what fifa well, regardless of whatever action fifa takes against the association it doesn't stop that country from invoking its laws against erring members of the association. You see, okay. that's really within the confraternity, you have rules to punish deviant conduct. Yeah. But that punishment usually is not enough for the purpose of the public interest. And therefore, whether FIFA is acting or whether CAF is acting, in terms of crime, the public law uh, still needs to run its course. But that's where, yeah. unless there's, but this is, sorry, but I was going to say, but that's where there's a tension, right? Because some public laws exactly. infringe on human exactly. rights, right? So, so it's it's kind of, trafficking, yeah. corruption, procurement, so to, uh, 
yeah. Fry. Should we go to Kel- should, should we go to Kelvin? And then I'm going to have to. I think just for the time, we're going to have to do like quick fire, and so I have to speak less and let you guys talk more. Um, but the um, Kelvin, over to you, and then we'll do quick fire questions on the on the remaining ones. Okay. Um, in that regard of football being neutral in matters of um, politics and all, I think um, it's all about. I like to use this word finding a, a balance because w- you must appreciate that sports, football, is a tool in terms of the enormous potential it has. Take, for instance, society, people are looking for jobs and all, and then you realize that, okay, so many people are gainfully employed in in football. And then the government will say, okay, we want to create jobs, and football can create jobs. So why don't we use football to create these jobs? Um, You want peace, you want tranquility, and you find that when um, in Nigeria, the Super Eagles are playing, everywhere is peaceful. Like uh, Mandela said, the sport uh, has power to change the world. So it's all about using sports to get to these um, political, social, and economic ends. But sometimes it will be difficult finding that balance. But it's just how you can find the balance that is. But it remains a tool in the hands of politicians, in the hands of government. I'm voting for you, Kelvin. I'm voting for you. <laughs> I agree with you. That was a, like, <laughs> you should run in an election. That was excellent. <laughs> no, I agree, though. That, that's the truth. And it, it's quite powerful. I think I love that emphasis on, on positive, focusing on some positive attributes. That said, we have a, qu- a question from Ethan Thawe um, from Zambia. So we have a team in Zambia that was dot points in the league for non-payment of players dues. And they have issues of not uh, paying players salaries and this is something we've seen uh, in other places as well uh, it was one of the teams that FIFA Pro warned uh, as one of the team's players should not think of of joining basically they warned not like I think he's saying not to join FIFA Pro um, my question is what's the fate of players uh, that have been in a team where they're owed huge sums of money and uh, would have to leave the teams I think there's some recent changes to the FIFA uh FIFA have made some changes on this recently. Um, I'm not sure if anyone wants to tackle that, but I think there is, um, we probably need to do a piece on this around unpaid players. Uh, there's legal action you can take, but again, whether or not people can, is that, is that everyone's nodding, I think, but yeah, whether you can afford to take that action and whether you can sustain a, a livelihood whilst that action's taking place is a, a difficult one. Does anyone want to contribute on that point? So we've got, I think, six more questions. So, so- yeah. Yeah, go for it, Brian. The issue of non-payment, the, the fact that you're not paid in itself is a breach of contract, which yeah. uh, I would imagine by any standards of any laws, you you, you can uh, terminate that contract and, and move on. But the essential point here is, uh, as you say, Sean, FIFA has now uh, laid out a specific process or procedure that you need to follow. You sort of need to place them in more... Uh, tell them you haven't paid me. I think those periods have been extended to two months uh, at most correct. that you need to follow. And then if they don't pay you up, uh, you, you can walk away. But I think it's more important when you then want to seek sporting sanctions against them. Because, uh, for instance, in South African, so let's, before I even go to South African law, most of these contracts would specify that if you're not paid or if you're in breach, you give notice of, for 10 days. If they don't comply, then you move on. You could do that if that's what the contract says. But if you then want to seek sporting sanction against the club, you then have to follow what the FIFA regulations say. Because if you have not complied with that, you may you may be awarded your 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 money or your damages, but there's not going to be any sporting sanction against the club because you haven't complied with that. But the bottom line is, it is a breach by any standards. You can walk away. And so, so the other thing is, Christian, maybe you want to just confirm it's correct, that we've got a webinar next week with Carlos Schneider from FIFA, who's a head of discipline there, and he's going to be talking about the changes to the FIFA disciplinary code. But I believe now um, that they're, um, even if, so say, for example, when a club uh, gets points deducted, maybe they go into liquidation, they reform as another entity, you can still take action against that new entity now, which is something that's new to, within the, I think that's correct, but to join the webinar next week <laughs> uh, to hear it from the horse's mouth or with disciplinary code. Chris, is that is that correct? From, that's right, yeah. 
yeah, yeah from, from the article we've got, we've got an article coming out as well uh, hopefully later today I think on, on that point uh, but it's a really good point about this non-payment you know evidential issues as well I know there was a player in uh, fifth pro representative in uh, I think it was Zimbabwe was helping a player who was basically alleged to have been paid and then they had to go for this evidential um, matters uh, before the core of arbitration for sport I think it was a FIFA DRC then the core of arbitration for sport eventually they got the award and then you have to uh, you know get the award enforced so it can be a long process um, uh, Josie Vandalos again has said uh, do you feel CAS has enough African uh, arbitrators listed is that is that a problem for African sport Ooh, good question all right <laughs> Who wants to take that? Do you, you could, yeah, you don't have to give voice an opinion. You could just say, "Yeah, it'd be great to see more African <laughs> people on the." Uh, yeah, you can, you can be political about it. I am someone well, who's a. Okay. All right, perfect. Good. Personally, I'm someone who's a stickler for for rules. Um, I do not like to reckon too much with um where you're from. I yeah. think it, I don't think it matters too much because the rules are there. If over time we see that the rules are being, the implementation of the rules are being skewed against Africans as it were, then we would have cause to complain. But, but then again, for whatever it is worth, you could want to look at the number of cases from Africa, the number of qualified arbitrators from Africa, and all of that. But all in all, when the rules are there, whoever sits there is guided properly by the rules. I do not think there's too much to complain about. Uh, okay, and then uh, Friday, do you want to add anything? I think we have to probably, we've got so many questions. Shall I just run through all the questions and then we can decide what we're going to pick and apologize to everyone for not doing it because we're, we're running over. Um, let's do one person respond to each of these. Let's do, let's do that. Uh, using the current scenario in Nigeria, where there is still an active involvement of national and state governments in the administration of football, what is the best way to give investors, oh, good question, the comfort they require to invest funds in the game in Nigeria? Very good question. That is from Kahindi Orochi. Who wants to take that? I think that that <laughs> I think I'd like to address that. Um, I think um some of the issues we have in football in Nigeria is they are essentially a reflection of the wider societal issues. If you look at the regulatory framework, as limited as it as it is, look at when you talk of clubs administration, look at club licensing, look at the football federation statutes and all. I think the club licensing determines to be a professional club what you need to do in terms of your setup and all of that. And if you follow it, if a club follows it, I don't think there'll be too much. I don't have a problem with a government owning a club. The issue is how is it run? A government like a uh, manager entrepreneur could have a club, put it in their in competent hands, and it is making money for the government. It is employing people within the government's jurisdiction and all. So it's all about enforcing the rules that we have. As limited as they be, they, they may be, they, they go a long way in, in answering some of these. So, so, so that's that's one, that's, I'm gonna argue the toss with you on this slightly, but if, if I was a commercial investor, you know, and say, for example, and I think the point is that when it's political uncertainty, you know, we talked about this, like essentially you're only gonna, the only people who I think can make a big difference are people who have got the, commercial clout to be able to survive and influence beyond a political change so say for example you're a small time investor in football and there's loads of political uncertainty you're probably not going to choose football as the thing to invest in because it could change overnight and i think you know this nba i keep talking about the nba africa fiba thing could be quite interesting because that's obviously they're going to attract some very major uh, sponsors and hopefully give you know attract some you know native like you know local um african companies to, to, to invest in sport because they got that big international brand behind them. Maybe that might, you know, cause there be a, to be a sort of a change to say in um, in uh, assessment of risk. Maybe, who knows? Uh, right. Super interesting. We need to do a thing on basically on, on. We probably need to do a guide on like what steps people should take um, to try and help with this. I think it would be quite useful just to direct people. Um, now I can't see your full name, so apologies. Ritumpop, Ripom Top, sorry, Yakuba. Yakubu, sorry. Oh, terrible. Um, so I'm using a very small screen at the moment to, to, to view this. In terms of dispute resolution in 
sports in Africa. Are there any alternative ways of resolving sporting disputes apart from regular courts? Is there a national, is there a na any nation that has alternative methods of resolving disputes? So basically, are, are there alternative dispute resolution mechanisms within Nigeria and South Africa, for example? Who wants well, to take that? If I can start from, from a yeah. South African perspective, I think most of these uh, associations or federations uh, have their own internal tribunals. Whether they work properly or not, that's a separate issue. But uh, often their rules say you need to refer your disputes internally, and then they have those tribunals. Uh, and as I said earlier, uh, but that doesn't preclude the courts. If there is any uh, public law issues or uh, unfairness of some sort, the courts will still have supervisory jurisdiction. And uh, in South Africa, currently, there's a bill before parliament where uh, the government is looking to uh, uh, put in place a national uh, dispute resolution, a sports dispute resolution uh, uh, tribunal where all sporting uh, disputes would eventually be referred. We'll see how that works, but it probably will solve some of the issues we face currently where there are claims of bias and impartiality against the tribunal set up by specific sports. Okay, brilliant. Okay, uh, Nigel, do you want to take that, DG? I think we're probably yeah. going to have to, you do you take this and I'll read through the other questions and then try and summarize and then uh, we'll, I think we'll have to do a part two by looks of things. Mm -hmm. Okay, so quickly, I think the position is the same in, in Nigeria. Uh, internal mechanisms exist, they don't work perfectly and you still find many cases going to the ordinary courts. I think it's what we had said earlier, you have, the, it's like administrative process. You've got to exhaust the administrative or internal process, or some wrong has to be, have been done to you even by that process before the courts can then weigh in. But critically, you know, some football clubs that are owned by going concerns, by government or by corporate organizations, and they are running their football clubs by the side. Usually the terms of employment are governed by the going concern. So it's, it's linked to the normal rules and conditions of service of, for instance, an administrative official in that company. And that, that's a complication. So, you sign up onto that, you are just like any other staff of that company, and you can be treated in, in that way. Okay, so um, I think we got so, got two, well, there were two questions really. One from, I'm just looking at to, 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 to do this. So, so Sakikio Nambaku says, your name, name is Yakubu, so sorry, like is that, I'm not sure if that's me pronouncing anything wrong or, or it's just coming up wrong in terms of the um, how it's being presented. But um, so to come back to, I think I didn't ask the question earlier. What do you think, uh, quick fire? What do you think the main challenges of a professional player uh, developing themselves as a brand? Key challenge, key legal challenges, I guess, uh, for that. Who wants to do that quickly? Like rap, I'm talking like a couple of word answers, key points. Anyone? I think quickly, and Kevin can jump in and see. His, I think the, the most important aspect is probably the, the intellectual property laws in their jurisdiction, because that's where you would find most of the protection. I mean, the agreements that you may have with your sponsors or anyone are basically uh, binding be, between the two of you, but not to the rest of the country. So you probably need to, to look into the intellectual property laws of, of, of various countries and see how best they can protect themselves uh, before they even become that, that brand. And bearing in mind some countries don't even recognize such a thing as image rights or personality rights. So there's absolutely. still a challenge there as well. Yeah, absolutely. So Kelvin, did you want to add anything on that? And then we've got two more final questions which are related. I think uh, he has answered it basically, the strength of your IP rating, yeah. Okay, brilliant. Um, so uh, that's another project for us, intellectual property, development of intellectual property rights in Africa, I guess, in African sport. Um, so Kenya, like Nigeria, this is from uh, Karen Nur, uh, I think that's how you say it. Uh, Kenya, like Nigeria, is faced with widespread corruption. How do the speakers and as practitioners intend to implement 
try to implement to, to challenge the um, issue of corruption. So quick, quick thing, what would be your, I guess, what would be your number one thing to sort of like re reduce the risk of corruption is a better way to phrase it, I think. <laughs> well, I, I think um, for, for issues like corruption, it is basically to see that um, the laws in place are evenly applied. First, the internal rules, and FIFA has developed rules on issues of procurement, conflict of interest, and so on and so forth. But apart from that, there are external rules, and we've seen, even currently, we've seen officials of um, uh, the Federation uh, currently under investigation uh, by the national anti-corruption bodies. So it's simply enforcement, even enforcement of the rules, and and uh, that's the only way to go with the uh, keeping corruption out on the table. Far, far right. Do you want to ask anything? Say anything? Sorry, on that. Yeah. Your one uh, one top tip, let's say. One tip, yeah. I think uh, it's it's not always easy to deal with that issue because it takes you back to the issue of uh, governance interfer government interference in sport. So you have federations that have codes of ethics and so forth. They don't comply with them. Some of those uh, incompliance is actually criminal. But when the government says something, the government is very federation. <laughs> Kelvin, you're not being attacked by dogs, are you? <laughs> raining cats and dogs, yeah. <laughs> literally, <laughs> literally raining cats and dogs. Um, okay, uh, thanks for I sorry for, cut, for cutting you off there. Um, uh, I just think for time, we've got one last thing, which was from Sikeo uh, Wondolo. Um, from Brussels was basically saying, and I think we touched on this, the issues of, of sort of unilateral imposition of rules by the governing bodies, does that cause a problem for investment? If they're good or bad, depends, you know, the lack of trust, maybe. Um, I think we have to pick this up another time because we've run significantly over. Thanks for everyone um, who's lasted the course and thanks for your great questions. I'm sorry if I haven't, uh, if I've missed anyone who wanted to ask a question or if I've uh, you know, misrepresented your question, uh, it truly wasn't intentional. If you um, uh, one, if you liked what we, if you like this, if you really enjoyed it, please tell people. That's always what we ask. Yeah, we'll do more of them if people find it useful and engaging, um, but particularly useful and helpful in terms of what you're doing, your work, uh, your knowledge base. Please do just share um, on social media, on Instagram, on Twitter, on LinkedIn. Tell your friends. Every <laughs> everyone if there are any other questions please i think the best thing to do would be if you email um info at lawinsport.com if you have any further questions that you think you know we'd like to explore further um thank you all for for so many questions that's awesome really enjoyed it um thank you to our speakers they will do a virtual round of applause <laughs> brilliant thanks chris and uh, other than that um Oh, thank you, Tola. Just said, like, a great webinar. Well done, guys. There you go. So other than that, I hope everyone has a fantastic evening. Yeah, it'd be morning, afternoon, depending where you're tuning in. Um, yeah, and yeah, as I said, just please please tell people if you enjoyed it. We'll do more of the same. We've got one later today if you're interested on sort of player contracts and player contract rights um, to do with FIFA regulations and, and stuff. That's at 5 p.m. today. Then next week we have the um, uh, FIFA disciplinary code webinar. And then after that, I think we've got one on human rights that's going to be coming up. And then we've got our annual conference in September in London. Other than that, um, yeah, thank you all very much. Uh, great chatting with you. Thanks, guys. Really enjoyed that. Thanks for all your support and uh, for your time and input. And particularly Kelvin, given that it's raining and we got your name wrong somehow <laughs> <laughs> on the link. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Bye. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you.